Our first gospel reading this morning comes from the book of Luke, chapter 6, verses 36 to 42, and it can be found on page 838 in your pew Bible. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. He also told them a parable. Can a blind person guide a blind person? Will not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully qualified will be like the teacher. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, friend, let me take out the speck in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first Take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. For our second reading today is a gospel reading from St. Matthew's Gospel. It's from the 18th chapter, and this is another one of Jesus' wonderful parables uh, that leaves our head spinning a little bit when we read it, uh, wondering what he's talking about at certain points, but we're going to look a little more closely at it today and see if we can't get a little bit more understanding. Beginning in verse 21, we read, Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sinned against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, seventy-seven times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him ten thousand talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him saying, Have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had money, mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my Heavenly Father will also do to every one of you, if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let's pause for a moment of prayer. Oh God, we thank you again for this chance to gather together as brothers and sisters in Christ, as a church family, and to begin our week the right way, seeking you, worshiping you in your presence. We pray in this short time that we spend together that you would bless us throughout the whole of this next week. Fill us with wisdom, courage. Give us what we need to be able to handle the, the challenges that come across our paths. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Well, for his birthday, Ed's wife, Candace, bought him a new outfit, brand new outfit that she'd spent hours one afternoon thoughtfully assembling for him at a local clothing store. When Ed opened his gift, however, he was disappointed. He said, clothes? <laughs> Darling, I would have much rather found something in the driveway that goes from zero to 250 in a few seconds. <laughs> well, the next morning, on his way out to get the newspaper, Ed noticed a small gift-wrapped box in the middle of the driveway. Confused, he opened it up, and he found a brand new bathroom scale. <laughs> Zero to 250 in less than a few seconds. And boy, everybody makes mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. Like, for instance, insulting your spouse who spent hours thoughtfully picking out a gift for you. Uh, but St. Paul is very succinct in his letter to the Romans when he says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all make mistakes. We all hurt others. We all do things that uh, we'd rather not have done after we did them. We all need God's mercy, and thankfully, we receive that through faith in Christ. God freely gives it to us. And Jesus, in our parable today, he teaches us a powerful way that we can thank God for this merciful grace and change the world in the process. It's a great uh, deal here. We can, we can express gratitude to God and we can also change the world. And it involves us showing mercy to others in situations where it requires a sacrifice on our part. It involves us showing mercy to others just as God has shown mercy to us in situations where it requires a sacrifice on our part. Now, Jesus' story is yet another where he discusses this issue of debt. You know, I remember years ago, one of my seminary professors, he, he once remarked, he said, you know, it's amazing how much Jesus talks about money in the Gospels. And, and it's because Jesus does, but more specifically than money, it's this issue of debt that Jesus keeps bringing up over and over again. It's woven into so many of Jesus' stories, either explicitly or it's, it's hanging around in the, in the background. It's the, it's the big elephant, if you will, uh, in the room, sitting there, either in the forefront or the background in Jesus' stories. And it's the thing that's threatening people's well-being, and therefore guiding people's decisions. You know, and this, of course, is for reasons that we've talked about many times before, because of the way that debt was being used by some people in Jesus' society to control the lives of others at their expense. See, and being indebted to someone in Jesus' day in the Roman Empire, it gave that person an incredible amount of power over you. Now, today in our society, thankfully we have laws designed to protect protect those in debt and their families from those uh, to whom they are in debt. Uh, there's always a political argument as to whether those things need to be strengthened or not, but the laws are there one way or another. And uh, For instance, we don't have debtors' prisons anymore. In fact, there are very few circumstances under which people in our society can receive criminal prison sentences for financial debts if, if they didn't acquire those debts illegally. It can happen, but it's really, really rare. Um, for instance, if you're unable to pay your mortgage, you might, you know, tragically 
lose your house, which is horrible, you know. But, you know, Wells Fargo can't throw you in prison for 30 years till you pay your next mortgage payment. Uh, likewise, if, if you fail to pay your credit card bill, it's not legal for someone from Chase Bank to come over to your house and, and beat you with a rubber hose. You know, <laughs> debtors are protected in our society, but few such protections existed for debtors in Jesus' society. If you owed somebody something, and you couldn't pay in a timely manner, and many times that was determined by them what timely meant, well, you might as well has, have been in debt to John Gotti, you know, it was, it was open season on you, you know. And we discussed before that society was structured in such a way that made it really difficult for most people not to go into debt to someone. They could work their whole lives. They could work as hard as possible. They could save and be conscientious and things were structured so that they would go into debt and owe somebody something. It was, it was a terrible situation in Jesus' day, which is why he brings it up so much. And it's, in fact, the very situation that this man finds himself in at the beginning of, of Jesus' story today. In verse 30, verse 23, for uh, this reason the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. Now, first of all, uh, the Greek word translated as slave in our pew Bibles, doulos, uh, uh, it could actually refer to someone who wasn't a slave, someone who wasn't owned by another person, but actually for some, someone who worked for a person as a, a servant. And I think in, in this story it makes more sense to interpret the word that way. So that's how I've interpreted this. This man uh, was not owned by his master. He was just a hard-working, blue-collar guy, you know, working hard for his master as a servant. But secondly, verse 24 mentions that this servant owed his master 10,000 talents. Now, what does that mean? Well, remember that the Greek word talenton, that's translated as talent in English, it described roughly, you know, the amount of precious metal that an able-bodied person could carry at one time. It wasn't an exact measurement. It was about how much you could pick up. In practice, it was anywhere from 75 to 200 pounds of gold or, or silver, which was the equivalent of more than 15 years of wages for someone like the servant in our story today. And this guy owed 10,000 talents to his master. So the first question on my mind is, is how did this servant come to owe this master 150,000 years worth of wages? I mean, <laughs> what did the servant buy? A small city, you know, maybe a, a kingdom perhaps? And, and how in the world could he ever hope to pay off that debt? Well, he couldn't pay it off. And as I mentioned before, sadly, that was the point. It gave this master, this guy, complete control over his life. And in Roman society, if a person's debt grew large enough, as this guy's clearly had, well, one of the things that that could happen and did happen to many people is that they could become their lender's slave or they could be sold into slavery to someone else because of their debt. And that's exactly what happens here. That's why we read in verse 25, as, as he, the servant, could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions. 
So what we're witnessing here, what Jesus is doing, He's taking us in to the life of one family that is on a journey from freedom into slavery. And there wasn't a dadgum thing that that family could do about it. It involved all these technical rules like debt and the like that had been arranged in in society. It was no different than someone grabbing them from their home and enslaving them, putting them into slavery. As messed up as it was, this is the reality that most people were facing in Jesus' society. They were on their road to being slaves. First they took their land. Then they made them day laborers, many times working for the same people who owned their land uh, that was previously theirs. Um, And then they ran up these large debts for reasons that they could not control, just the cost of, of things were fixed where they couldn't afford it. And then, oh, boy, you shouldn't have run up so much debt. We're going to have to put you into slavery to pay it off. That's what was happening to most people. Jesus' ministry started in the middle of this process that many of his listeners were going through, which is what makes what Jesus says next so incredible. See, up until this point in the story, you know, most people have been like, yeah, this, this, is a, this is a familiar story. This happened to, you know, my cousin. This happened to this person. You know, I'm in this same situation. But then all of a sudden, Jesus says, out of pity for him, the Lord of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. And a better translation of that word pity there in the Greek is compassion. So this master suddenly, out of the blue, has compassion for this servant. And he forgives the debt. But it doesn't only mean that he forgave that debt. What it meant is that this master was turning the current social order on its ear. So he was releasing this guy from an entire system designed to squeeze as much possible out of him and his family for the rest of their lives, including, eventually, their freedom. And that was a great sacrifice on that master's part. Because we can imagine that that decision would not have been too popular with some other masters in the area who liked the social order just the way it was. Thank you. you know, but this compassionate, courageous guy, he didn't care. You know, he, he, he put it all out there. He, he made the sacrifice of arousing the anger of his colleagues. Being ostracized and marginalized in society himself because that was the right thing to do. And that's what mercy looks like. He made a big sacrifice. But how then did that servant for whom he sacrificed respond? Well, everybody's mouth would have dropped when Jesus told this part of the story as well. When you read, he went out, came upon one of his fellow servants, who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then this fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I'll pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. Now there's that debtor's prison there in verse 30 that I mentioned earlier that we don't have in our society. And by the way, a hundred denarii, what this servant owed the other servant, was a third of a year's pay, a sum that that other servant likely also didn't have, especially if he was borrowing from another servant. In fact, he was probably in danger of being sold, him and his family himself, so he borrowed from this other servant who was already in debt just to make it by. There's no way he's going to have that much money laying around himself. So the servant whose debt had been forgiven, you know, he, he was thinking to himself, you know, wow, you know, my master forgave me. This is my opportunity 
to get ahead, man, to, to get on top of the world like all these other rich guys. I'm going to go extort this guy who I know doesn't have the money anyway. I'm going to force him to pay me, and then I can be just like these other masters. But you see, this defeated the point of his master's mercy in the first place because it perpetuated the same screwed up system that was enslaving people in Jesus' society. See, if instead the servant who had been forgiven, if he followed his courageous master's example and he used his newfound power to show mercy to another, he could have been a part of a chain reaction of blessing that might have ended up changing all sorts of people's lives for the better. Maybe it would have inspired some of the master's colleagues to get on board. Maybe things might have started changing for these, these families in crisis. But you see, that would have been a sacrifice for that servant not getting his money. See, he, he, would have, he, he would have had to stay with, with nothing. You know, sure, he didn't know his master or anything, but he was poor. He wanted to have money. And that would have been a sacrifice for him. So he instead decided to rip this other guy off, which is why his master responded the way he did. You know, without the background, we wonder why in the world would this master get so angry at him? But now we see why. You know, he says, you wicked servant, you should, not, should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I have had mercy on you. He basically took everything that his master had done, the, the sacrifice that his master had made, and he nullified it by his greed. See, when we show mercy to other people, even when it involves sacrifice on our part, we demonstrate our gratitude for God's mercy by participating with God's Spirit in this domino effect of blessing that ends up changing people's lives for the better. It doesn't stop in this world. It draws them into Christ's loving arms that gives them eternity as well. And our merciful act, it might have nothing to do with money at all. It, it might involve giving someone who we've formerly written off another chance to, to re-enter our lives under appropriate circumstances with appropriate conditions, of course. But it might be our decision to give someone a second chance. That, that is our merciful act. Maybe it's letting go of a long-held grudge and finally moving on in life. Maybe that's our merciful act. Or, or maybe it's taking time and effort to nurture the life of someone who we otherwise might not have nurtured. But regardless of what form it takes in our lives, our sacrifice will be Become part of changing things for better. We couldn't possibly see how many ways God will use that one act of ours to transform people's lives, but He but He will. So so Jesus' story challenges us to ask ourselves this question: Who in my life right now could I make a sacrifice for? by showing them mercy. Amen.